What's up, my wizards? Dev, SBMTG. Down there, we got more of the Shadows Over Innistrad spoilers for you today. We got a lot of cards coming at a fairly quick clip, so today I'm just going to give you what I think are sort of the most impactful cards from the spoilers today. I'm leaving out a few things that I don't think are very impactful, really at all. But you can always go to mythicspoiler.com, check out everything I've uh, left out here. And no, they didn't pay me, I just really like them. Another day, another planeswalker. This is Jason Raveler of Secrets. It's three of anything and two blue mana, and it starts with five loyalty. That's not bad at all, right? You can plus one it to scry one and then draw a card. You can neg to it to bounce a creature back to its owner's hand, or you can neg eight it to get an emblem that says that uh, whenever an opponent casts their first spell of the turn, you counter that spell. There are a lot of people calling this Jace boring, and I understand that, but in this set that's full of a lot of fresh design and Wizards is trying a lot of new things, I actually sort of welcome the simplicity of this card. And boring doesn't mean bad. It's plus one is pretty darn good, and scrying first is more important than you might imagine. But, you know, card advantage, that's exactly what you want your Jace to do. It's neg two is fine protection, you know, not the best thing ever, but still counts as protection. And I actually really like the ultimate on this thing, and you're not going to get the ultimate all the time or anything, but there are definitely ways in a control deck where you can just, this basically says they never cast a spell. Um, and resolve it for the rest of the game, you know, when they go to cast their second spell, their real spell, we're playing control, we can just counter it with an actual counter spell, most of the time. So, it's going to be tough for them to ever resolve a spell again if you get the ultimate off, but it's going to be really tough to do that. I'd be remiss if I didn't point out the similarities between this and Obnixilis, as everyone in the world has already done, but those similarities are there, and I really, really liked playing Obnixilis, you know? Um, just was talking about him the other day. Every time I play him, he does good things for me. But, you know, Jace draws cards better than Obnixilis. Obnixilis kills creatures better, and their ultimates are completely different, although they are both, like, really grindy and sort of inevitable, but Obnixilis is way more inevitable um, as far as the ultimates go. So, you know, when comparing the two cards, I think that Obnixilis goes in all these, like, mid-range decks and stuff, and Jace looks like more of a control card, although he could go in, like, a ban mid-range or something like that. Although, you know, I've, I've brought up ban a couple of times recently. That might be real. As far as where this Jace goes, he looks like he'd be good in control, but I don't really want to tap out on turn five unless maybe I'm playing no Jutai. Maybe, and I could see doing that. Um, but as far as this, I don't know if it's worth tapping out on turn five for. Not saying it doesn't seem solid, it definitely seems solid. I'm just really not sure at the end of the day what to do with this. But, decent card, I'd probably give it like a B-. minus. Next thing I want to talk about is another blue card, and I actually think it's a little bit better than it reads at first glance. This is Epiphany at the Drown Yard, cool name. And it's X and a blue for an instant. Reveal the top X cards of your library, separate them into two piles. Your opponent chooses one of those piles. That one goes into your hand, the other pile goes into your graveyard. Most people are just saying that it's the worst thing ever that your opponent gets to choose which pile goes into your hand. Not necessarily so. I love that you can cast this for just a couple of mana and separate, you know, two one-card piles. That's kind of actually neat. Or, very late in the game, you can, you know, make two three-card piles. Which is actually kind of awesome. You know, getting three cards is always good. Um, especially at instant speed at the end of their turn or something like that. Looks decent in control decks. Doesn't like replace Dig Through Time or anything, but still looks good and allows you to dump cards into your graveyard, which is actually not a bad thing in this format. Um, dumping cards in your graveyard to reanimate maybe later, or just do graveyard shenanigans of all stripes with. Seems good deliriums in the format, so that's probably not bad either, you know? Because the card looks a little bit better. I wouldn't sleep on it is all I'm saying. Um, and it's probably just a one of or two of copy index, if it's indexed at all. But it's definitely something we're going to be testing with, because I have a feeling about it. I don't think it's like incredibly powerful, but I do think that it's a draw effect that could be worth playing. Here's something, it's mythic. This is Sigarda Heron's Grace. It costs three of anything, a green and a white. It's a four or five legendary angel with flying that gives all of your human creatures hexproof. That's pretty cool. You can also pay two of anything and exile a card from your graveyard to put a 1-1 one, one white human soldier creature token into play on your side. Well, honestly, just not anywhere near as good as the first of Garden. I'm sorry about that. End of the day, though, for this standard format, assuming, just pretending that no other card named Sigarda ever existed, um, it's still probably fine. Um, I, I don't really know how important green-white is as a color combination. We'll have to see. And, of course, we don't know how good humans are as a tribe. So, it really hinges, um, this card hinges on a lot of things. <laughs> but it's still a 5-mana 4-5 flyer that gives all your humans hex, but it's not, probably not too bad. And I actually kind of really like her second ability there, and that's being overlooked a lot. 
I think it's actually reasonable to expect mid-game to be able to remove three, four, five cards from your graveyard, even though we don't have fetch lands. You know, this set is obviously focused on putting stuff in the graveyard in some ways. Um, but green, green and white probably aren't the colors that put things in the graveyard. But that being said, looks overall decent. I just really hate that it doesn't have hexproof, but you trade that for giving all your humans hexproof. Problem is that this can just be removed. But it's fairly resilient. It you know, beats most of the removal in the format. So decent card. I want to talk about a couple of lower rarity uh, vampires here before I get to the HBIC vampire, um, the serious vampire. Um, first of all, Olivia's Bloodsworn looks pretty good in the budget vampires deck, as does the next card. Um, but Olivia's Bloodsworn is one of anything in a black, that's two mana, for a 2-1 flyer. We've seen a few of those recently, um, like four of those recently, and it can't block, you know, just like Bearer of Silence can't block, and you can pay a red to give a vampire creature haste until end of turn. Yes! All of it's yes, and it sort of reminds me of Forerunner of Slaughter in a way. You, ch you trade a point of power and toughness for the ability to fly, but still just a mana to give one of your vampires, um, you know, a member of your tribe, essentially, just like Forerunner, haste. That's good. Um, just a 2-mana two 2-1 two flyer, already fair enough stats. It seems relatively pushed. Don't know how important it's going to be in you know, higher level magic, but just for the budget black-red deck, this is one of those pieces we absolutely need it. Don't want to spend too much time on it, but just want to point out that this is definitely another decent piece for a fairly cheap deck that's actually looking pretty competitive. Another vampire I wanted to sort of highlight is Indulgent Aristocrat. It's just the one black mana for a 1-1 one, one with lifelink, and you can pay two and sack a creature to put a plus one, plus one counter on each vampire you control. That's pretty good. And the first time you read this, you think it's going to be put a plus one, plus one counter on like a vampire you control. No, it's each vampire you control. And I actually think this is kind of neat. You know, we just saw, um, what is it, Falcon Wrath Gorger. Um, that seems like a great one drop, don't get me wrong. But it also seems like a terrible top deck. This is the inverse of that. You know, pretty bad early, but amazing when you top deck it late. And just even one or two activations could be a, you know, end up in a huge blowout on a board full of vampires. So I would at least look at it for maybe a two of, and it's really synergistic, you know, it allows us to drop Zergo, which is what I was playing, alongside Gorger as a one drop. You know, you can just play two copies of this maybe, I think, as a good two, uh, good top deck. You don't have to play four copies or anything. Um, and the, the red one drop is just obviously far superior. But it's a sack outlet, which might matter, and I just love the fact that you can make your team huge for just like four mana a um, little bit later in the game. So you know, look out for it. It's, I don't think this is terrible. That said, two mana is sort of prohibited. Let's, let's just be, let's be honest. At least it doesn't tap. At least it doesn't tap. We've got that. And it's not sacrificing another creature. You can always sacrifice this if you wanted to. So it could be an you know, early game one drop, and then later on in the game, sack it to itself if you have nothing else to sack and give a, your whole team counters. This seems pretty versatile, has some flexibility to it, and I actually like the card more than I did when I first read it. The more I think about it, it seems like a pretty decent piece. But the last thing I want to talk about today is probably my favorite card on the day. This is Olivia Mobilized for War. Silly name. But Olivia Mobilized for War is one of anything a black and a red. That's three mana for a 3-3 three, three Vampire Knight with flying, and of course she's legendary as well. If you're keeping score, by the way, three mana for a 3-3 three, three Flyer, pretty good right out the gate. But it also has this stupid thing. Whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, you may discard a card. If you do, that creature gets a plus one, plus one counter, gains haste, and becomes a vampire in addition to its other types. Okay, what? Obviously, it's a madness enabler. Getting sort of sick saying that, though. We need to see a couple more good cards that actually have madness. Give us a few of those. Um, but, you know, another madness enabler. And the fact that it gives the creature a counter is awesome. This card is an exercise in things that could have been worse by a lot, you know. This couldn't, didn't, it didn't have to be a plus one, plus one counter. It could have been a temporary stat boost. It didn't have to be any creature. It could have just said, would a vampire in his play under your control? And ditched the whole, like, you know, becomes a vampire in addition to its other types. It also could have been whenever a non-token creature enters the battlefield under your control. It's any old creature. So far, a lot of the discussion around this card has, for whatever reason, focused on how dumb her name is, or how much people don't like the art, 
or how silly her sword is because it's just like not structurally sound. It's really impractical. So, I mean, a lot of weird discussion about the card, but don't sleep on the actual card. The actual card is absolutely dumb and instantly the best three drop you can play in Rakdos Aggro. And even in the Vampire Rakdos deck, I'm including Drana in that, although you probably play both of them together. But this is this is just absolutely instantly the best three drop for any aggressive Rakdos deck. And we are building the budget red black aggro, but definitely seems like this card is going to be the major difference between budget and non-budget. Because it's probably going to fetch a pretty penny for at least a month or so. And I don't know if it's going to cool off after that. It all depends on the impact of the card. But the card will almost certainly have some impact. It's just too stacked not to be played. That's all I got for now. There's probably going to be more spoilers tomorrow, and very soon I'm going to bring you the Rakdos Madness Day. So stay tuned for all the content, and whenever the set comes out, we'll have spoil, we'll have the set review, you know, we'll pre-release stuff, you know, draft. There'll be a lot of stuff we've got coming up, so subscribe if you're new, and if you enjoy the content, hit the like button. That seems like the most prudent thing to do. You can also share if you want to, you know, whatever you want to do. But, um, in any case, I'll see you guys later. Thanks for watching, my wizards. And the sword that she's carrying is really, like, Impractable. Impractable? <laughs>